guest speaker and convince sorry about that, that her mother, uh, Honorable Royal Highness Princess Bilolevu herself wanted to give the group the name of Ofakitonga for us in the diaspora to remember the love of our motherland. <clears throat> okay, our purpose here in OKT, in addition to remembering our love for the motherland, the purpose of the Ofakitonga platform is to provide a space for Tongans everywhere to reconnect with our core values in our culture and language. Furthermore, we hope to amplify and validate our many different experiences across the diaspora. We are also an evolving decolonizing space. This may come with a lot of discomfort as we aim to deconstruct colonial mindsets, rhetoric and behaviors in our communities through thoughtful and provoking talanoa. All right, for our rules of engagement, I'm gonna hand that over to Liliane uh, to go over the rules of engagement for this space. Hello. Thank you, Lily. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, our rules of engagement for today are in line with our Tongan core values and how we choose to define them in this space. Due to past tensions and incidents in this space, we have taken a lot of time and care in creating these rules of engagement. If any of these rules make you feel called out, please sit with why that is. Feel free to reach out to folks who are willing to unpack that with you as well. The first one that we want to highlight is Paka Apa Apa, which is acknowledging and returning respect. Next is Anga Faka To Kilalo, Lototo, humility and open to learning. Next is Dauhiva Kaa or Dauhiva, which is keeping the relationship ongoing, alive, and well. And lastly, mamahi hi mea, which is loyalty and passion. And then in the next slides, we're gonna go into a little bit more detail about each one. Uh, our first rule of engagement, faka apa apa, is we want to make sure everyone is respectful of everyone's learning journey in this space as well as everyone's backgrounds. We stand with our lady and queer community. We have zero tolerance for homophobic, anti-queer, and slurs or rhetoric. We also stand with our Kainga Uli Uli community. So we have zero tolerance for anti-Blackness. We do not use the N-word, appropriation of AAVE, and other Tongan der derogatory terms and rhetoric. Next is Anga Fakato Kilalo, or Lototo which is we want everyone to be open to learning about other perspectives and experiences that are different from your own. Be humble and take accountability when called out for causing harm unto others. Also to sit and lean into that discomfort if that occurs. Admit when you have caused harm to others because your impact is greater than your intention. Next is Dauhi Va Ha'a or Va. Pass the mic and make space for others to speak. When bringing up heavy topics of discussion, especially um, topics that can be harmful or violent, please consider prefacing triggering trigger warnings for the well-being of others in this space. And also check in with each other, reach out and offer, ask ways to help or ways to amend any harm that have been caused and also accepting the consequences when you aren't following rules of engagement. And that can end up in possible suspension from the group until actions to making amends are made. Next is mamahi, mamahi i mea. Try to attend weekly meetings as much as possible. Be proactive in your role in this space, bring good energy, share what you've learned and invite other fellow Tongans with similar interests. Or with the, or those with the desire to learn, be a better ally to those marginalized in our communities, and speak up when something doesn't feel right. Next, we're going to talk about how to get um, registered for OKT Zoom meetings. You can register by going into the Instagram OKT Instagram and tapping the link tree in the bio here, and then it'll take you to this page. 
and then you'll just tap register for upcoming OKT Zooms and you'll get a registration form sent to your email. For our Zoom etiquette in our OKT space, you can have your mic and camera on or off. Please unmute when you are speaking or mute if there is loud distracting background noise. You could also use the chat box if you can't use your camera or mic. Although it is not required, we do encourage everyone to participate in the, um, we won't have Lesoni this week, but in the Dalanoa portion. If it is your first time to OKT, we encourage you to do a self-introduction. Otherwise you may be removed from the room for suspicious harmful activity. So I'm gonna pass it off to Lily to do our next part. Thank you, Liliana. Thank you so, so much for uh, doing that for us and introducing the rules. Um, before we get started, we're gonna go over the five factors. We're gonna acknowledge the sacred, the sacred and paying respects and asking permission um, starting from the highest in the hierarchy. Um, thank you. And I'm just gonna get that started for us. Uh, Welcome everyone in Malo Lele to OKT. Thank you for joining us. Um, for introductions today, I think we're just going to skip that because we're going to be focusing on our uh, main guests. Um, um, which is, drum roll, it is our great, uh, an awesome uh, medical doctor and health promotion coordinator for the Ministry of Health in Donga, uh, Dr. Pateli Pateli Seal. Um, I'll go ahead and hand it over to him when you're ready to let him talk about himself and who he is and what he does so everyone gets familiar with him. Deli, when you're ready. Uh, thank you very much, Lily. Um, hello, everyone. I am honored to be uh, given this opportunity to um, talk about the um, health sector in Tonga from my point of view and um, my journey so far until reaching this point. As um, Lily has mentioned, I am a medical doctor working at Viola Hospital in Tonga Tapu. Um, this is going on my um, fifth year working in the hospital. Um, uh, as most of us uh, in Tonga, um, we graduated from Fiji uh, Medical School and came to Tonga to continue um, to work for the Tongan government. Um, but before I continue, um, I'm from uh, Kolonga. My dad is from Kolonga, Kolovai, and my mom is from Tatakamo, Tonga. So to start off, um, uh, coming back to Tonga, I started working at Viola Hospital starting in 2018. So from to the, our, our medical um, profession is divided into, you start as an intern, as all other um, medical professions in the hospital, you start as an intern and then you become a medical officer. And then you come back and choose your profession that you wanna choose in Tonga. So for me, it was my two years as an intern in Tonga so that's 2018 to 2019. After two years, you're, provide, you're given a choice which island you wanna go and work in for the next one to two years. So I chose Ewa because Ewa was the closest to Tonga and I didn't wanna be um, far apart from my family and friends. Um, Ewa is just a 10, min, uh, 10 minute um, flight or you can take the ferry, which is one to two hours, depending on which boat you can um, take. Um, I was in Ewa for one year and um, after 2019, 2020 that was in Ewa, 2021 until today I came back to Tonga and I chose to work as um, health promotion coordinator um, in Viola Hospital. Um, in more detail towards my work, um, from last year until this, um, this year May, I was um, in between um, working as a health profession, um, 
health promotion of, um, coordinator, at the same time working with our repatriated passengers from overseas. So I would uh, stay with them inside the MIQ. There were um, times when it was three weeks, we had to stay inside our um, MIQ, we had to look after um, our passengers. Um, also the worry for me um, while working inside MIQ is our pass uh, passengers who were um, patients. Eh? So they were um, taken overseas um, treatment and if it was work, um, if the treatment was successful, they came home, spend more time with their families. And sometimes um, the treatment wouldn't be successful. So they just came back to Tonga and just um, live out the rest of their days. Um, during quarantine, I think the worst case for me was a young girl who had a brain tumor. She went to New Zealand, treatment was not successful. She came back to Tonga. I was um, fortunate enough to look after her at that time. Um, she had complications while inside, but we managed just to ensure that she leaves quarantine um, still alive and, and able to spend time with her family. And when she was released from quarantine, we heard two weeks later that she passed away. Um, so that was one of the um, tragic moments for us. And it was hard um, majority for us as the workers inside MIQ because we would, this was during the three week period. So she would be with us for three weeks. We attend to her 24 seven. Um, majority of the time she would be in um, pain and we will provide her with all the relief and uh, appropriate medications at that time. Um, so, so it was either that, after three weeks, I would come out of MIQ, then I'll do my job, um, um, my JD, my job description as a health promotion officer. So this included um, outreach um, programs into the community, it should be in um, screenings, um, health talks. Um, other times we would do radio or TV um, programs. Um, if that doesn't, um, if that wasn't available, we would um, work on um, our material or IEC, IEC materials for the public. Um, during uh, COVID, uh, before COVID hit Tonga, that was majority of my um, my work, and also when the eruption and COVID hit Tonga, I then moved on to um, uh, working as a risk communications um, not specialist, but working in that area in providing Tonga the right um, um, materials and uh, information for the public to be put on TV, radio, and also on um, Facebook if um, it was available. Um, I think uh, since last year until this year, that was majority of my job. And behind that, I managed to get a scholarship to work through my um, um, postgraduate diploma in family medicine. So I just finished it this uh, May. Um, that was done from at the Fiji um, National University uh, in collaboration with um, GPs from Australia. Um, we were fortunate enough to um, be provided this scholarship. So. Yeah, um, thank you to all the sponsors who are um, happy enough to uh, um, fund us. So it's me and uh, other um, uh, doctors, young doctors in Tonga. Um, uh, in terms of all those um, work done, um, I managed to uh, start a youth um, uh, mentoring program, which was done in my village, Kolonga. This was done in 2019 um, before I came um, to, uh, before I went over to Ewa. The reason why I started this was um, I noticed that my village wasn't um, having enough graduates um, from university or even up to um, finishing their high school. And me and several other youth um, in our Catholic church were, um, we thought why not give our time um, to help this um, youth who are struggling so we got some um, funds from the Queen's Commonwealth Trust. Um, we, this was um, provided um, to us in which we only brought materials. It wasn't enough. So we couldn't um, pay teachers to come over and uh, help us. So what we did was um, we would uh, provide our time to mentor these kids. Um, in whatever subjects we may feel that we excel in, or we um, we think we we all we can still remember some of the calculations from high school. 
So that was uh, another part of our um, my work as despite all the other work in the hospital, I would um, also give my time for the youth. I'm, I don't have, I'm like, I always talk with people about my, uh, I really want to help youth in any way I can, but sometimes the work is too much and we are not provided the opportunity. But if there is a time in that um, I can focus on um, youth and also um, on my work at the same time, this would be something that I would choose. And that is why I love working um, as a health promotion coordinator because it's all about outreach. You talk to the people, you reach out to the people. I chose this instead of working inside the wards like the surgical or because I would wanna talk to people face to face. Sometimes you can just treat someone just by talking and just by talking, clearing their mental state and also just finding the right treatments for them. Sometimes us as doctors, we as, someone, as soon as someone comes in, we just give them right the medicine right away and then go. And we don't sit down and listen. And that is something that I, um, I that is why I chose public health because I want to listen and I want to talk and interact with people because this way people can trust us more. And I, I'm sure every tongue in here knows or in, in almost everywhere else that the hospital is or the medical field is um, very, it, it's criticized by the public for a lot of things, but despite um, all the criticism that we have, we, we, we chose this profession because we love to help people in any way we can, despite the lack of resources that we have in Tonga, um, the specialties um, or the specialists or consultants, we are able to um, continue forward with, um, with what we have. Um, so, yeah, I think that's uh, just a short introduction to um, um, working in Viola Hospital. Um, I'm sure if there's anyone with any questions, um, especially with um, the way we run things in Tonga in our health sector, I would be um, happy to elaborate if, if need be. Thank you, Lily. And so everyone has like a question, but um, I still want to say thank you for sharing, you know, taking the time to share like your experience and like the obstacles you had to go through just to, you know, be who you are today. Um, and I really like that you're um, investing a lot of like your time back into like the community. Um, most people, when they succeed, they just move on with their life. Like, okay, I'm done. I made my mula, so I'm good. But now you're turning back, you know, like I'm going to go back home and rebuild a community. And I think that shows a lot about your character. And I think that's, you know, something we need to work as, as a whole to, you know, build a community up or build them up into a better, a better place for, you know, future generations. You know, especially with the public. I didn't know. Obviously, I didn't know that public were criticizing the hospital. You know, medical. I mean, I live here, so I didn't know that. So thank you. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think it's very interesting to see that your perspective that you you prefer to go out and do like social work, where you're, you know you're like um, out there in the field talking to like patients, like, hey, how you feeling, or what are you up to? Because even that is in essence kind of like not medicinal, but you're helping them mentally, like checking in on people. So I didn't have a question. I think I was just commenting. But if anyone has a question, feel free to take over. Oh, I, I'll read the question in the chat. I got to help out here. Um, Malo Lili for facilitating tonight. And well, happy you're here, Dr. Patelicio. And this question is from um, Kaloni Bereketi Philip who's currently a medical student um, here in the States. So uh, we're happy that some of our folks here um, who are in the medical field there are Tongan are um, joining us. So her question is, what has the general attitude uh, been towards COVID in Tonga and also towards the vaccine? Okay, thank you for the question. Um, before I came here, I'm currently in New Zealand for holidays. Um, before I came here, we had a survey done in Tonga. Um, this was in collaboration with UNICEF. They funded um, this survey, which was um, 
we try to generalize the opinion of Tongans, especially towards COVID and the vaccine. Um, the, the general attitude of Tongans towards COVID was initially, um, it wasn't really of concern. Um, they took it we, as the border was, um, we were isolated from everyone else. We had um, repatriated passengers in which the passengers would be isolated in the uh, facilities such as Tanoa or another hotel. And people felt safe. Um, and when the, um, so it shows people felt safe was when the vaccine was brought, was available in Tonga. People felt too safe. They didn't go take the vaccine. They just roamed around Tonga despite um, all the talks on radios, um, TV, um, even on, on Facebook um, from the Ministry of Health um, page. There was really a slow increase um, in people getting COVID. So this shows that people weren't really um, of, um, concerned about COVID because they thought they were safe. As soon as COVID hit um, Tonga, the people rushing towards getting vaccine was a lot. Um, even up to midnight, people were still lined up at places where the um, vaccine was available. And the nurses would say, ah, sorry, we would have to close. Um, this was just a, vac a vaccine available for today. You can come tomorrow. And then the next day, people would be lining up before the place was even open. So um, initially, we weren't surprised because Tongans are like, when something bad happens, then everybody rushes to find the, the solution. If you just keep talking about it before the um, disaster occurs, nobody would really care. Um, but yeah, as soon as COVID hit, people were lining up for to get a vaccine. Um, as, so initially when the vaccine was in Tonga, um, the people getting vaccinated was increasing at a very um, fast pace. Um, until it reached a certain point in which misinformation started um, showing up in social media. Um, people started uh, saying, oh, probably this is not the right vaccine. Um, religious beliefs came into it. Um, scientific um, research, I have um, people br brought up on social media, they found on the internet, um, uh, supporting their claims. Um, but so far, with the, uh, what we are focusing now on is trying to tackle this misinformation. So before I came back um, from, before I came over, we visited um, at least four villages um, in Tonga. So at least we go to one village and we um, tell, tell the other surrounding villages, we are going to um, have a talk, health talk in this village about the vaccines. And we went to um, Fatahi. Um, so that covered most of the Hihifo district. Um, uh, we went to Fuamotu, that was for Tahahake. Um, I forgot the other two villages. So my, this was to address um, the misinformation that people are hearing. And at the same time, we were um, pushing for um, the booster dose that was available in Tonga. Um, from the research or the survey that we found, majority of the people already got already know what COVID is. They have been saturated with information from the internet before COVID hit Tonga, and they pretty much know what it is. Um, it was just a vaccine that people were more hesitant about. Um, one example would be um, we we're trying to get the kids vaccinated from 11 to 18. Um, reasons why they weren't vaccinated, um, parents weren't um, supporting it was because the parents had some side effects. So they were scared or um, they didn't want their kids to go through the same thing. Such and things like this were um, um, reasons why young um, kids were not um, vaccinated in Tonga. But um, as I said before, our job is to provide information to the people. And if we provide it through other media platforms um, and it's not going out, we go out to the community ourselves to talk to the people in person, address their concerns face to face, and people would appreciate it more when the information is brought um, to them um, through a face to face manner rather than um, reading it off uh, Facebook or um, or listening to Dharma sessions after church or other um, places. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, oh, that's sweet. <laughs> Thank you, Bob Billy. Yeah, it's 
misinformation is all over the place, even here in the US and the diaspora. I mean, it's very hard to handle. And I mean, you guys are trying your best to tackle that, you know, try to help out the people and like try to re-educate them and understand like this is a necessity and essential for your livelihood. I believe Alamoni had a question for you in the chat. So I'll go ahead and read it out for you. She asked, um, Malo Evahe how do you deal with burnout and maintain your mental health as a busy medical professional? You know, obviously you're so busy. Like, how do you how do you handle all that? Oh, I think it's um, everyone has their own coping mechanisms to address um, burnout and um, stressful days. Uh, for me, it would be um, family time or um, talking to my uh, my partner. Um, so I stay in Tonga and my uh, girlfriend stays in uh, Wellington, New Zealand. That That is not the reason why I'm in New Zealand. Um, but um, so somehow when I hear their voice or just talk to them and just sit down and have a conversation, somehow I feel relieved and um, stress-free. Um, other times would be talking with friends, going out for a cold beer, um, but it would be spending time with people. That's the most, um, that's the way I really my stress um yeah i think that's uh, one the way i do it money i'm sure you have different ways <laughs> thank you um for sure uh socializing you know and like touching back with people you feel connected to definitely brings up the morale and you know like oh you can go on another day you can clock in for your shift again um there was some questions um, from our IG um, story that I'm gonna ask you. Um, let me see here. The first question is, what long-term impacts on Donga's health do you anticipate due to COVID? Long-term impact. Um, for COVID in Tonga, there is a universal thing talked um, term or syndrome they call the long COVID. What was it called? Um, but usually we just address it as long COVID. Um, people have certain um, side effects or symptoms after they get COVID. And this changes from different people and, um, and the symptoms that they have. Uh, the long-term effect um, towards their health, I don't really see uh, COVID as having much effect in Tonga and their health. The problem with Tonga's um, health is more of the lifestyle. Um, this has been occurring for a, a while now. And so in terms of the lifestyle, so there are certain um, factors that we are trying to address from public health. So that's the um, inactivity. So that's decrease in physical activity, um, unhealthy um, consumption of food, so that's the diet, um, abusing of alcohol, and also the um, abusing of um, um, tobacco, smoking. So that's the four things, inactivity, diet, smoking, and alcohol. These are the four main risk factors that Tongans are facing, and we are trying to address that from our public health. Um, if, it's, uh, if it's COVID, COVID doesn't really have much effect on the um, health of the Tongans in the long term. It's these four factors. NCDs is rising in Tonga. Um, the youngest kid I've seen with um, diabetes is 13. This was a 13 year old girl when I was working in Ewa. And the pair, um, she's, yeah, she's, her sugar level and stuff is, um, is poorly um, controlled. Um, I, I guess it just comes down to um, your support, uh, your support system, wherever you are. Um, whenever I work with um, someone who's diabetic or just got diagnosed, um, if you're married or you have a partner, what I usually tell them is um, find well, work with your partner or your wife or your husband on the diet, on your um, physical activity, stopping your smoking or um, decreasing it, um, or your alcohol as well. Because it's really hard for people to change their lifestyle by themselves. Um, I was telling them, if you're eating your salad here and your wife sitting on the side with a KFC, obviously you're going to leave your salad on the side and reach over for that uh, drumstick. 
But if you do it together, the work together, if you work together with your partner and have that support system, um, I'm sure um, Tonga can um, decrease the NCDs that is um, we are seeing rise on the rise in Tonga at the moment. So, yeah, it's not really a much of a long term effect of COVID. It's just a effect of our lifestyle in Tonga. True. I mean, in essence, I think the islands were like have a high rate of like obesity and like high blood pressure and gout. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense why we'd be concerned about COVID because we're very, uh, I guess there's an increased chance of you getting it. Um, hopefully that answered the question from Instagram. Um, from Instagram. Uh, I do have a second question. Did anyone have anything before I read this question? Yeah, uh, feel free to leave it in the chat. Crystal has a question. Um, I had a question, but I can wait until after that question no. in the chat. Go ahead, ask your question. Oh, okay, thank you. Hi, uh, Malele, uh, doctor. Um, my name is Crystal or Cristolo, and I live here in Hawaii, um, <clears throat> but I still have, we still have a lot of family members that live in Tonga. So when you were talking about like some of the, sorry, I'm out of breath. I just got home from a flight. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, but um, when you were talking about the concerns, um, like public perception of, you know, the hospital and its workers, like, I kind of understand that because I hear it all the time from my relatives that are still there in Tonga. And mm. even I lived in Tonga, I was there for like first grade and fifth grade till fifth grade. So I kind of like understand um, because a lot of times they're like, oh, would they rather go to like the... The clinic you know like yeah. the clinic run by like the how the how we like the white doctor or whatever and it's really sad to hear that and from me like i'm still invested i still care about like the healthcare needs there in tonga because i still have a lot of family members there and we go there we go back and forth all the time <clears throat> so yeah. my question as like a person here in the diaspora that like does a lot of community work here but still wants to be able to support our country in ways you know in like ways that's sustainable and that actually helps Tonga like be self-sustainable and self-sufficient um yeah. what is it that we can we do or like what are like the healthcare needs is that something you guys are exploring because I see um a lot of folks here that talk about wanting to help Tonga, especially after the, especially after the volcanic eruption, you know, like all those containers coming in and everybody rallying to get stuff sent. And a lot of times that's the reaction is we need to send, send, send stuff. And, but I feel like a lot of times we have to sit back and really think like, what is it that they need? Well, how can we help them help themselves and not come from this like charity perspective of just like sending things. Cause we want Tonga and like, you know, the government and the medical system and everything to be able to stand on its own. I'm sorry, it's a very winded question, but I guess like, what is it, how can we here in the diaspora that, you know, do feel invested in Tonga and its um, country and stuff, how can we help? How can we help? How can we support? What kind of support can we offer you guys? All right. Thank you, Crystal, for the question. Um, I've so far, Tonga has a lot of help from overseas. Eh? So um, Tonga is not a developed country in which we um, have a lot of export or have a lot of money to fund our our projects or what we have in mind to help our people. And um, through the assistance of um, big organizations such as UNICEF, WHO, um, UNDP, and other organizations, they have um, supported us in um, providing um, the funds to um, help out with our family. What I see in Tonga is um, an issue is the programs. There's a lot of programs and a lot of funding, and these are usually misused or it's not sustainable as you have mentioned. Um, uh, some people would uh, fund for um, uh, what do you call it, vegetable gardens in villages for the women. As soon as the funding, they buy all those um, seeds and everything they clean up a, a field start um, uh, planting after one harvest that field is like 
no more. No one goes there anymore. It's just totally forgotten. Um, other places, they would do um, Zumba sessions for, and they would pay certain people to come do the Zumba session. As soon as the money is done, people are not coming to the Zumba, no more um, mentors and er everything like that. And it is very difficult to um, to sustain certain, some programs because it all comes down to the mindset and the uh, consistency people uh, do things. Um, if the way I see it, if people want to help Tonga, I have certain friends, um, young doctors such as myself who are here in New Zealand, um, they would say, oh, Deli, can we come Tonga? We, we, we want to work and come Tonga and help. He said, oh, no, 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 don't come now. You're still young. Uh, come after 20 years with all your experience and all your connections and help Tonga at that time. Don't come now because I think we, we can't really help Tonga with one year. <laughs> um, but in 20 years, I'm sure you would be a uh, top-notch uh, doctor in New Zealand. You'll have a lot of resources and bring that to Tonga to help out your, um, your people. Um, but for um, Tongans, to help Tongans, I think it all comes down to just um, um, making sure that we have a support system in place. Um, it is not, um, let's say it's not, it's, it's not easy to change our mindsets. Like I mentioned earlier about the risk factors that we um, are trying to address in Tonga. It all comes down to you, uh, our, us family members, talking to our families with certain diseases or who are at risk to change their lifestyle. Um, support them, push them, and make sure they're consistent with the changes that they are making. Um, it doesn't really have to be resources. It doesn't have to be um, funding. If they just change their lifestyles alone towards their health, this would be a great, this would be already enough for them. Um, it, it's no use if we uh, bring funds and then we buy gym equipment and send them um, food and everything, dietary food um, from certain places when they are not using it or not consistent enough. The problem with health in Tonga is that a um, majority of the people they have, uh, they're not consistent with the lifestyle changes that they make. Uh, an example would be the challenges that people are doing. They do a challenge for eight weeks, lose uh, 10 kgs. After eight weeks, they start eating, no more exercise. Then they can gain another 20 or 15 kgs. So it really comes down to the consistency and the behavior um, that people should adapt in Tonga. And as, if Crystal wants to help her family, it all comes down just to, to support them and make sure that they change their lifestyles for the better. I, I hope that answers your question. It does, it does, thank you. Yeah, preventative, I feel like, yeah, preventative care and education is like so important, but it's like the hardest to implement program. Yes, it is the hardest, that's the, <laughs> it is the <laughs> hardest, thank you. Kaloni, did you have a question? I see your hand raised. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Kaloni. I'm from Arizona. Um, as Alice mentioned, I'm in my last year of um, medical school at the University of Arizona. And I just applied yesterday to become a family medicine physician. So I'm entering into residency. Woo! Anyways, nerve wracking. But besides that, so I, um, I rotated back in, at Viola um, back in 2019. I rotated um, at the time the residents were Wai and Sioli, and we were in oh. the <laughs> Yeah, and they were right. amazing. They were amazing. But I, I also got the opportunity to work with Lilia Mitangi, um, Toa Fakakovi Kaitao, Dr. Sione Latu. And oh. I just wanted to say um, being here in America and then coming to back to Tonga and rotating there, there the compassion that the doctors have there is palpable. Like you can feel just their love for the Tongan people. And they, weren't un they were unafraid to demonstrate that, which is so different from American doctors who almost have like a wall um, between them and patients, which is fine. It's a coping mechanism and yeah. whatever. It's defensive, it's fine. Um, but um, being in Tonga, you could just tell that um, um, especially when I was working with Dr. Toa, uh, she's a pediatrician there, and um, she her work is amazing. And we would go out in the community and do ultrasounds of kids' hearts, and she was doing it um, out of love. It wasn't like she was getting paid extra for all of this. She was truly doing this out of love, and so that that's something I just want to take time to acknowledge and recognize is that um, 
I think as Westerners, we have a tendency to want to bring what Westerners have back to Tonga. But let me tell you, Tonga has things that they could bring here to America. Their compassion, their love, um, their love for service, their love for people, their willingness to um, get out of their comfort zone and support a patient is amazing. And I just wanted to just take that time to just acknowledge that. And um, to point out, like I had no, <laughs> when I went over there, like you were saying, um, I just went over there just to observe, to see what, what medicine was like in, in Viola. And I was just blown away with the, I know you guys are under-resourced, heavily underserved. You guys don't have a lot of the things that, you know, we, we have here in America, but you guys make do with what you have. And that is so admirable. And I just wanted to acknowledge that. Malo. Thank you. Wow, such a good, oh, that was really good, that one. <laughs> Yeah, um, just to touch on what you talked about, you know, like, like having, um, I guess, like, your, your doctor friends, like, stay overseas for a little bit longer, so that way they can, like, build up that skill set to bring back home and rebuild, you know, the motherland, um, Donga. Um, I can see how that really is, like, just a beneficial way for us to build ourselves. I feel like just sending like a cup of food over, like ramen noodles, like, hey, kwe, te unlove, there you go. I did my part, you know, you yeah. can live on that. But really, if you used to, like have people come back, like scholarships and stuff, go and learn all these things and come back, like, hey, I learned from this school and I could probably like do this this way and that way we can um, better serve, I guess. Um, I'm off on a tangent right now. Um, uh, once again, thank you guys for your questions. Do you guys have anything else that you want to ask him about Delhi while he's here? Thank you so much, uh, Koloni and Lily. I want to echo uh, Masi's question that was put in the chat. Uh, Masi said, thank you, Dr. Pate Licio, for your work in Tonga. As an EDI advocate and professional, part of my focus is well-being of persons of disabilities and mental health issues. As a person who works on outreach, how have you dealt with either of these issues in the health sector? Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Um, for Health Promotion Unit, I'll just uh, sum up our department. For Health Promotion Unit, we are divided into um, different sections. So we have uh, some people looking after healthy promoting schools in which they work with the Ministry of Education for um, healthy programs for the schools, um, healthy workplaces. There's another group of people working with the workplaces, doing the screenings, the health talks. Um, we have um, in healthy churches. So uh, one of our, our workers um, is with working in co collaboration with the um, uh, there is a group for the churches in Tonga, so they work together with them for all their health needs, such as um, screenings, health talks, and um, other stuff. Um, in our side as well, we also have a nutritionist, and we also have a public health psychologist. So for the mental health um, uh, area or issues we have in the public, we um, put, give this to her, to our psychologist in our side, so she addresses these um, areas um, there are also times she does awareness, um, she has, does radio programs, and she also has um, consultations. She has a few patients, she has her own room in our um, department in which um, these cases are brought over the next day or the same day, and, we, and she does her um, psychology um, consultation with them. Um, and that is how um, we address these mental health issues. Um, other times we would go together, I would... Uh, uh, um, accompany her in um, visiting schools or workplaces, um, even up to um, just groups, community groups in the um, community, they would want someone to talk about mental health and we would um, go together and talk and discuss mental health issues with um, uh, people who would wanna listen. Um, I think the last time we had a screening was for the Digicel in Tonga. Um, we did screening for them. And then we would go back and um, present to them the results of their um, all their workers, 
at the same time have our nutritionist present on alternative um, um, diet um, that is provided in Tonga. And also the me- our psychologists would also have a time to talk with them um, on mental health issues, um, coping mechanisms, especially in times of burnout or stress from work. And um, if there's anyone who would want to um, have a um, session with her, she would um, give them available a time she's available. They can come over to the hospital, have a session with her, and then see if there's a need for follow-up or more. I, f- yeah, I hope more. that answers. Um, does that answer your question for you? All right. Um, yeah, um, for sure. Like, I feel like nowadays, uh, I'm, from my observation outside of Tonga, I see a lot of people going to work and stuff, and I see them like going to be like, oh, shoot, I'm stressed. Like, how do I deal with yeah. it? You know, I see a lot of like, you know, the dotupus in like medical field and nurses, they're like mm. all like nine to five. So I can see like how they can get stressed. They're like, oh man, I need to. I need to vent this somewhere and how do I do it in a very healthy way? And yeah. I'm very happy to see like there's an option for that in Tonga, you know. Um, I know we had Moni here earlier, a couple of weeks back, who talked about, you know, uh, toxic environments and work and how to deal with, with it. Um, yeah. let's, let's get to here. Um, I believe there's another question in the chat for you. Um, Let's take a look at it real quick. It's from from Crystal again. Her question is, how has it been navigating the political system and trying to encourage policy or programs aimed at improving the health wellness of Donga's people? Uh, Donga is, uh, in terms of politics, it's very... um, I hope I don't go to prison for this comment. Um, it's very chaotic. And um, I think for an example for me would be um, during COVID. And we are the people working on the ground floor. Um, and we are the one interacting with um, the people, um, especially in providing them with the information in, in terms of COVID and um, other stuff. Um, but sometimes we would... Um, listen on the radio or see on TV that um, certain changes done by the, the government that we weren't aware of. And um, sometimes it, it puts us in a difficult position because um, we told people this, the government told people this, and then we have, but at the end of the day, we had to go to, with what the government is telling the people. Um, and I remember one time we were working for COVID um, when COVID already hit Tonga. Um, we had to call them for, um, call people and look for their primary contacts, investigate. So there was being a in- case investigator and we were telling people this sort of information. And then little did we know that there was a press conference that was done like one hour ago and they were telling the people a different thing. So it really was uh, difficult um, to navigate from our, from health being doing health stuff without the government um, um, interfering or doing their own policies, not based on um, the information from the ground level, from us, we were working on the floor. And, but at the end of the day, um, they're the boss, we are the ones working. We just made sure that people are provided the correct information. Um, we call back, apologize, sorry, um, the policy has changed because the government already said this, this. Um, but it's okay. It's some people, majority of the people were okay. Oh, it's okay. We heard the, from the radio. We know you guys are stressed from work. We're saying, no, 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 it's not that stress. We were given the wrong information, but um, thank you for understanding. Um, in terms of policy, um, it is, uh, we, the policy side is okay. Um, we have certain um, people who are working in um, projects. So if you can't work for the government and um, the pay is not as good, people go work for projects in Tonga, which they um, get better pay and um, and they would uh, um, help with the policies, especially with the policies. And which is good, 
because majority of the Tongans um, if for doing policy towards health, it's very low. Majority of the other policies, um, foreign policies or policies of regards to the law, there is a lot more. And I think for the health sector, we are slowly increasing in people who are specialized um, in this um, area. Um, for, so navigating through um, policies for in regards to health is easier now because we have certain people who are um, specializing in that. But with, in terms of um, the politics, it is difficult sometimes, but um, we deal with it and then we adapt and compromise um, because they are the boss and we are the workers on the ground floor. At the end of the day, it all comes down to the health of the people. If the people's health is compromised, and then we would probably fight back. But since their health was still intact, nothing um, happened to anyone with this misinformation. Uh, we were just going the flow. Wow, that's like a load of information. Um... Oh, thank you, Viviane. Yes, um, thank you for answering, and I'm sorry if I put you on the spot. <laughs> no, <you>. it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Dr. Patelli. Um, I also want to thank you for answering. Uh, I have a question from Tuipe, and they said, speaking of diabetes, is there an adequate medical support to deal with the effects of diabetes? And are there any other diseases on the rise there? So for diabetes, the most severe effect that we see in Tonga is um, kidney failure. So kidney failure requires, uh, at the end of the day, if it fails to a certain uh, percentage, um, you would need dialysis and um, or transplant. Obviously, we don't have that in Tonga, but uh, currently at the moment, there, uh, there is plans for um, a dialysis um, department to be set up in Tonga. Um, before I came, um, our head of department um, mentioned that uh, the prime minister and the minister of health is in um, America for these machines to be brought over to Tonga. Um, I'm sure there would be more people who would need to be um, trained to use these machines. Um, and But that is the worst factor for diabetes that we see in Tonga. Um, the other one would be um, amputations. Um, that's common in Tonga. In if um, if you go to the theater, um, operating theater, there's supposed to there's bound to be an amputation every day, and um, and that all comes down to like I said earlier, just the support system. Some people are uh, you just need to push your families to make sure they take the medications or um, look after themselves, especially their diet. Um, my grandma is um, eighty six years old. She's been di um, diabetic for a long time. She has not had an amputation. She looks after her diet and um, her medication. So it all comes down to just, we can all avoid the, uh, the, the complications. It all, um, it all comes down to the support system and just the willpower of the person who, who got the um, disease. Um, but like I said, it's important for us to um, support our families, especially when they have these diseases because it's the only, it's another way, a preventive way of reaching the complications that we are seeing. Um, for dialysis to be in Tonga, we are um, we are not really treating the cause, to be honest. Um, we are just um, providing people alternatives. Um, we say, oh, you can just be diabetic, but don't worry, we have a dialysis machine now. Um, so that's why I, I chose my side, because I wanna stop it, because I know we are not um, a rich country. Um, why do you need to spend on at the, for the end result or the worst? You can just stop it at the front. But yeah, I still got um, a lot of years left and um, hopefully I would uh, make a change in Tonga for the good. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Sorry for the other information. <laughs> yeah, preventative measures for sure. You know, that's it. definitely it's better to um, prevent things from happening. Um, and deal with it then and there. Um, um, I believe we're almost an hour into this uh, session. Um, and we're, we usually do like a picture time for those who are in this space. If you're uncomfortable, you don't wanna be in the picture, you don't have to, um, you know, 
you don't have to remove the video. You don't have to um, put yourself on screen. Um, but in this very second, uh, Liliana, when you're ready, we're going to do like a screenshot of those who are here. If you're comfortable, feel free to join in, throw a peace sign in. If not, you know, okay. So everyone who is ready, let us know. Liliana will take a pic and then we'll have, Alice will have a question right after. Okay. Um, Mama Lily. Okay. I'll do it in one, two, three. Yep. Got it. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Liliane. Thank you, everyone. I believe Le Alicia has a question. Oh. Sorry to keep you, um, um, you know, to my Lord, I feel my heavy affinity. I mean, it will be a few in me, but. Oh, you know, yeah. <laughs> we really appreciate the time you're spending here. I hope my questions are quick. I hope. Um, I, it's really encouraging to hear that in, in at least Fotonga, that public health is part of your medical education. And and because uh, I, as I understand it, and uh, I don't know if Kaloni probably left already, um, the, well, at least like public health is a separate uh discipline here in the in the United States from going medical school and so there sometimes it's hard to uh, cross you know to um, integrate the two so um, it's one of the barriers that we have in addressing health in our work here hey Lala knows this um, oh. is that like public health sector is separate from medicine um, so it's really encouraging to hear that the way you, you, it's practiced in Tonga at least that it is integrated uh, because I think that makes more sense, but that's probably because that's how our community and our culture works. Um, so my question is, I know that there are major hospitals, there's Viola and then Vavao and Hapai have their own hospitals. Um, but what, you know, are there community clinics? I'm going to ask a few questions on top of each other and then you can answer. Are there community clinics throughout um, Tongatapu that take care of the different regions? Um, that's one question. And then the other question I have is what is the role of the church in the work that you're doing around health, you know, prevention, health awareness, um, and the public health work that you're doing? And um, if they do play a role in that, is it effective? Yeah. Okay. Well, the first question for the community, um, we have health centers in Tonga, spread out through Tonga. We have one in um, one, two. So we have two in Hahake, like in the western, eastern. Um, one in Kolonga, one in Mua. We have another health center at Vaini. Uh, for um, Hihifo, we have um, Homa and Kolovai. Um, so people would go to those um, health centers. Um, we have we also have um, small uh, separate uh, uh, or different other uh, other places besides health centers for uh, vaccination for babies. So those are just addressed, just their main focus is just for the vaccination of babies. And they're spread out through Tonga. There are a lot more than the health centers here. Um, in Wawa'u and Ewa, they, uh, Wawa'u, Hapai, they also have their own um, community um, uh, health centers besides the, the main hospital. So they come to the um, health centers if, if the health officer who's working at that time cannot address the, uh, the problem and then they will send them to the main hospital. Um, EO unfortunately has only one. So it's just the hospital alone. Um, you're just in the hospital and everyone comes to the hospital and um, for their consultations. Uh, the question for the church, church uh, plays a big role in Tonga. Um, they are people that um, we listen to. And we know that um, majority of the people would rather listen to the to the pastor than to the minister or prime minister. And it's just our church and just a religion in Tonga. It's that strong. And why we use um, we work together with them is for um, because what they bring out to the public or what um, with them supporting the initiatives from the health promotion, people actually tend to listen. Um, so it's like it's like using when we do um, certain uh, promotions, you use celebrities or you use um, famous people that people look up to. So for Tonga, um, in our side, we also use health uh, um, church leaders because once the people here, church leaders are involved, they say, "Oh, we can trust this. We can support this. Um, these are people who are 
um, doing the right thing. And if they can do it, if they're doing it, obviously they know it's a good thing. And um, so we work with them for opportunities to do our health talks. So usually um, Sundays is most of the, the time everyone is available or they're all in one place and we would come to them, ask for their permission. And majority of the time they are very um, supportive of our, our initiatives or what we bring up to them. Um, also, I think for example would be our, um, so I'm Catholic and um, so the Cardinal was very supportive of our COVID when COVID hit Tonga. He was the first one to um, print out to the, um, and told all the um, priests to tell to the, um, to the what, to the congregation that you have to wear a mask to church. No one is, ex is exempted, everyone has to be there. When you do screenings um, for the past, uh, for the Kaupatele, for the priest, he makes sure everyone comes. If no one comes, then he just, he puts them on the spot. So it's, like I said, they are the people we look up to with, with their support. Um, majority of our health promotion work are actually moving forward. Um, just like how we work with um, the mi uh, ministries, we make sure we work with the CEOs and the ministers we put um, them and we provide them the information because once they are involved, everyone below them has to be involved as well. Or, and um, yeah, that's about it. Just using the leaders, role models in the community. Malo. I think it's interesting, interesting that, you know, like, you know, how Tonga is very religious, that you're there to try to merge the two, you know, um, so that way they can spread the awareness for COVID. Mm. I do see a lot of like Ikala Tahi support. We could probably use those celebrities, probably like all those rugby, rugby players. Like, hey, rugby players, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know you guys probably, probably already thought of it anyway. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It's like, a, is it rough or not? That's not, how do I phrase the question? Um, because you got like religion, you know, like traditional tongue and healing mixed in there. And there's a lot of people that don't really feel like they want, like patients, like you might tell them, oh, you need to take this like once a day or twice a day. And they'd prefer to go like to traditional med medicinal methods. You ever have mm. like patients who refuse like taking your advice? Oh yeah, I think that's a common thing that we see here in Tonga. If they don't take the medicine that we prescribe them, um, they would rather go um, and uh, use traditional or herbal medicine. Um, what we find uh, not frustrating, it's just difficult, is when um, they go out to the uh, medicine, to the herbal medicine, traditional medicine, <coughs> sorry, um, they get worse. And once they reach a certain, um, or they're almost near death, and then they come to the hospital seeking help. Uh, for me, the worst experience I had was um, working in an emergency department. This was a 11 year old boy who had a boil under his neck. Um, the parents, it was, it could be sorted out with antibiotics. That would be, a, it's just a boil. <coughs> the parents took the kid for um, a traditional um, help or herbal medicine. And the boy just got worse. And they only brought the boy, he passed out. He already passed away at home. And that's I, what I usually tell people is traditional medicine is good. It has some um, advantages, but they gotta make sure is that um, if they see it not improving, seek help to the hospital. Don't just stay there and you're assuming that probably the kid is gonna get better. And once it reaches uh, a stage in which no help can be done, then it's already too late. And so um, some traditional medicine works, I've, I've experienced it myself and it helps, it works wonders, um, but sometimes it doesn't work. So you just gotta be sure and um, advise the people. It all comes down to advising and making sure that people are provided the right information. 
just go for traditional medicine if you feel like it. But if it's not improving, seek help to the, from the hospital. There's no other way. Um, and I think just like I said, just a kid, um, just a simple antibiotic could have saved its life. But um, they chose traditional medicine and um, unfortunately the kid passed away. But um, it's just, a, we just learn as we go on and hopefully people, whenever I hear people um, taking their kids to um, for traditional medicine, I usually try my best to advise them properly because um, it all comes down to the information that you have. Some people are just told, oh, don't go to the hospital because you're going to die or don't go to the hospital because they're just going to provide Panadol only. Um, but if you just give them the right information, I'm sure people would um, make the right decisions as well. Is that also part of like your community community work back in Coloma, where you said like you set up a whole, like in 2019, you set up like this community thing where you're educating like people and community like, hey, these are some options that you could probably do. Like if you have a headache or anything, like, is that something you or like just to raise awareness and how to like provide first aid? Yeah. Uh, for the um, community, you usually do that in um, for the, for the church in terms of providing the right information. Um, so that's with COVID, the vaccination, and as you said, the treatments and also when to come in, um, what are the advantages of this? What are the disadvantages of that? And um, for 2019, it was only community and also just um, providing youth with the right um, opportunities or the right information as well. Um, what I like, with my work in 2019 was, was, was mostly focused on youth. So um, I just wanted to provide you with the right information because obviously majority of the adults already got majority of the information. Um, and usually majority of the time, it's not the right one. So if we're trying, if we can't get to the parents with the right information, might as well just go through the kids. Probably the kids would, um, they would listen to the kids more than us if they are uh, brought in with their information. Um, but for health promotion, it all comes down to providing the information, but you, you gotta be, um, what do you call it? What do you call it? You gotta be, um, smart in finding ways to portray to people. And, um, for me, sometimes if I can't go to the parents, I go through the kids, old enough kids, uh, and they would then pass on the information to the parents. Um, but yeah, I think that's answers your question kind of yeah for sure you did yeah um uh, Liliana you mentioned about um in the chat I believe you mentioned if there's any sort of supply that's highly needed back in Goma uh, let me just read her comment here she had a um a medical professional ask her if there are any supplies that are highly needed that they wanted, uh, because they wanted her to bring it back to Donga when she goes in the summer. She's, she was just curious. Oh, if it's in terms of um, um, the equipment and stuff, I think I'm the wrong person at the moment to, uh, <laughs> to ask the question to. But I'm sure there are, we are, I'm sure we will be happy for any donation, to be honest any extra syringe, any extra needle or any machine, that's already a blessing for us. Um, what we have now is barely enough, but we manage. And if we get one or two, that's a blessing. Thank you. All right, did, um, let's see. Let's see if we have any more questions in the chat. Let's get these done. Um, hey, Lily, I see um, Hilala has their hand up. Thank you. Go ahead, Hilala. Too low, and I apologize if I'm going over the time. My name is Hilala Potesio. Um, Maletaulava, everyone, and it's my first time being here. Fafofa Apito and Malo Apito to talk to Patericio for your presentation and for your time. Um, I have a few questions. I'm sorry for the organizers and the, uh, 
and for no, this no, don't one, apologize. <laughs> Take the time. Attacking. Need question. Uh, um, I know that. My first question is like for so I do a lot of public health work here and community health work with the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community um, here in Utah, in Salt Lake City, Salt Lake County. Um, what I find difficult is access to material on like uh, for Tongan interpreters, medical interpreters. And so Dr. Patelli, do you have like a, some information on that, how we can access that here in the diaspora for those that are, um, when it comes to that kind of work. And, you know, there's certain words for me that I find, and a lot of us in the diaspora communities, we, we're going to appointments with our parents, our grandparents, you know, and there are things that I don't understand. I had to learn along the way and still learning. It would be great if there is some data or some information for us here so that we can access that. Maybe I have the lack of knowledge of that, but that was my first question is there. Is there like access that we can get material for uh, like medical terms, health terms, especially in health promotion work that we do here in the diaspora? Yeah, well, um, we do have um, uh, materials in our section. So we also um, make the materials, the posters, um, the radio stuff. So usually in Tonga, we don't, like everything is um, from overseas, the information, the research. So what we do here is we translate it to Tonga and then we put it up in posters, we put it out in um, radios, TV, for the public to know. Um, if anything, I can just um, get your email and then I'll yes. check with the guys in Tonga if they have um, information and they can send it through. That would be great, Maro Pito. And my second Maro. question, thank you. And my second question is, um, what have you, I mean, in Tulo, this is like when it comes to certain health issues that are considered tapu or taboo. Mm -hmm. and, and for example, here in Utah, we have Pacific Islanders have the highest rate of STD, sexual mm -hmm. transmitted diseases. And there hasn't been a program yet. And I've, I've had discussions with other leaders in public health in the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community here. And there hasn't been much talk of it because of the Fapa Apa of mm -hmm. talking about certain um health issues like when it comes to mental health that was mentioned earlier and another aspect and uh, as well as sexual health and i think uh, there was also mention of disability too but how do you um so i'm sure those issues this issue is not just here in diaspora i'm sure it's prevalent in Tonga too how do you approach yeah. that or what do you find um, so with approaching certain what may seem controversial issues? For the mental health um, side, it just started recently. I think it, was, it wasn't it was really something that we um, that I saw when I initially started here in Tonga. And, but it's slowly becoming a norm. It was a stigma to talk about it and people weren't really um, having much concern about mental health until recently. Um, in terms of uh, sexual health, um, it hasn't been much talk on public uh, awareness, eh? but there are certain groups um, out there in Tonga that um, have time and they talk with youth. It's not like talking to a public or on the radio. They usually have community sessions. Um, I'm, I think it's Family Health Tonga. I'm not sure what's the name. So when I was in Ewa, this um, group usually comes to Ewa like once every quarter and they would um, bring in youth and talk to them about um, sexual health and it was quite diff the way they brought in youth was uh if you join the session they'll give you twenty dollars at the end and obviously every every youth is like oh yes credit get myself some data so obviously they were ten and so that's how they drew in um all this uh youth um just by getting the um that money but also at the same time they listened they did uh, workshops they did um group work and then made sure that people were um uh, taught and educated on sexual health. But in terms of uh, putting it out there in the public, it, it's not yet done yet. I think it's still like 
uh, traditional wise, it's yeah, it's really difficult. But hopefully in the future, since if mental health can, can do it now, and it's slowly becoming a thing and talk, I'm sure sexual health can be something in the future. Maro, Peter, thank you so much. I appreciate this. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. Oh, that's just a really great question, Kailala, and with like different perspectives. Obviously, with like the tongue and like our main core value is Paga Apa. So it's very hard to like, you know, jump yeah. into the, these topics without actually like, oh, you can't, you two can't be in the same space for us to tell you what this is. So it's kind of hard to tell yeah. like, what it's like, you have to go over there, that's your brother, that's your sister. Yeah. So that is a very tough one to tackle. Um, I'm just overwhelmed with so much information. Like I'm, there's a lot of things I never knew about and I'm like learning and I'm like processing and I'm just like circ circuiting. Um, but obviously I really appreciate everyone being in this space and like taking the time to like, you know, have this conversation, especially to you, Baten, you know, all the work you put in through I me mean, for you is probably like a normal normal day you wake up go to go to work come back and done uh, but you were putting in a lot of work you know we see that and we appreciate you um let me go ahead and see if we have any like questions here uh any time let's see i don't have any questions at the moment um if anyone in the chat has questions feel free to jump at it um if you're in the motherland which is donga if you have a, a, a if you're in the chat and you have a perspective you want to share feel free to feel free to Oh, I forgot. There was one question here from the IG story that they wanted to ask you that they actually messaged in. They wanted to know what was your greatest challenge doing it after the volcanic uh, eruption? That was the last question. After it, okay. Um, during the volcanic eruption, I was, uh, Sometimes I would volunteer my time to work out in the outpatient department. So usually they're short staff. So on this day, I volunteered to do some uh, consultations at the outpatient at Viola. I was working at Viola at that time. And as soon as the explosions were happening, I thought there was a construction work done in the hospital. I was like, oh, these guys are pretty loud. Um, why can't they put it down? There are people, I'm sure some patients are sleeping. And it had three explosions. So after the first, the second, and then the third, by the third, I knew something was wrong. Um, so we walked outside out of the outpatient's department and we looked up to the sky and we saw the uh, smoke and then we realized it was the volcano. Um, I think the challenge for me that day was um, trying to sort out the patients who are currently the outpatients already. Um, that was during. So trying to make sure that everyone went home um, safely, provided the right medicine, Nobody was um, leaving uh, with anger or not um, provided the right care. I think the, for me it was the one lady, she had an IV line on. She just said, uh, Doga, can you just take off the IV line? I need to go home immediately. I don't need any treatment. I said, okay, <laughs> you sure? I said, yes, yes, yes. She went home. She was on a wheelchair, but she just pushed herself outside and then called for her her son to come pick her up. Um, but it was just to make sure, um, I think the challenge we made during was making sure everyone was, um, uh, provided the right treatment. After the volcanic eruption, I was at home working, um, and I was called to work with the risk communication. So that's, um, providing info, like, just like health promotion, but, um, knowing what's available, the information giving out to the public. And as I said, on the night, um, to allow, usually people, uh, the information we have or we provide to Tongans are contextualized from overseas. So we do our research, find the right um, 
materials from different sources and overseas, but from the right um, sources. And then we'll translate that and use that in Tonga. Volcanic eruption, no internet, and Tonga has never had a volcanic eruption in which we have the information. So then we had to go back to old school, no more Google, had to find the nearest library, um, get all the information available. Um, we had to go USB as well and uh, use their internet for um, to look for information to provide to the public. Um, and so once we got that, and then I sat down with my Tongan dictionary and start translating this properly into Tongan, and then um, I told my workers, oh, take this to the radio, take to the TV, so they can um, tell the people what to do during this time. Um, so for me, after the eruption was, um, <clears throat> the challenging was finding the information to provide the public, and also uh, the translation to the Tongan, so it wasn't really a medical thing, it was really different, but I somehow manage. I think my tongue and it's not so bad, but yeah, I think that was the most um, challenging thing I had to go through. Thank you. Malo, malo, pateli. Um, ooh, you, you. That honestly, I'm really grateful for you joining us and like sharing and like informing us and teaching us, updating us, you know, about life in Tonga. Um, Hopefully we can all walk away from this uh, session with a lot of a little bit more knowledge and awareness and how we can better, you know, assist you guys here from the diaspora. Um, so I want to thank you, thank you so much um, for being here with us. And I want to thank each and every one of you in the in the chat right below for uh, being a part of this and you know tuning in, listening in, you know taking the time to be here with us. Thank you so much. Malo alpito. If anyone wants to say anything before we end this session, um, feel free to do so. I mean, it was great seeing every one of you guys here. Thank you, Moni, too, for tuning in. <laughs> All Thank right, everyone. Hello, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.